Um, so yes, as Matt said, um, I am giving two back-to-back -back talks here. Um, the first talk is going to be relatively short, um, and we'll have some time for Q&A between that talk and the second talk. Um, and this topic, sequential reconstruction, there is some, some depth here that um, we can get to, or if you're interested in going into the nitty-gritty details, feel free to reach out to, to me or to um, Brian Mellendorf uh, to get more details about what's happening here. But I really just wanted to talk more about what this uh, sequential resolver really means or sequential reconstruction means and, and a little bit of uh, comparison and contrasting that with our existing healing resolver uh, within ZFS. Um, first, um, a little bit of history. Um, this feature actually originates uh, out of um, the work that Isaac Wong did um, for the D-Ray project. Um, and um, a few months ago, um, Brian Bellendorf sort of pulled it from that, P the, the, the D-Ray PR and created a, its own PR, um, primarily because that allows us to get us in, allowed us to get us it into the, the code base before 2.0. Um, and it was really a separate feature that applied to more than just uh, the D-RAID feature. Um, so first, a little bit of taxonomy. Um, <clears throat> I'm putting this up here because um, the language around resilver, rebuild, reconstruction uh, is, is a bit confusing and sometimes conflated. Um, and we do use some specific language in ZFS when we're talking about these processes. So traditionally, um, data reconstruction ZFS always uses the term resilver. Um, I believe this probably dates from the time when we had mirrors as our primary uh, redundant data uh, representation. And so uh, mirrors use the term resilver to talk about moving the data back onto a copy. Uh, in uh, private placements. Um, this, though, got carried over to be used in RAID-Z as well because the same code base, the same processes were used to drive the RAID-Z reconstruction that's happening with a mirror reconstruction. Um, and this process is driven by uh, a, a pool traversal through the entire pool tree uh, uh, using the block pointer tree. Sequential reconstruction, as I just mentioned in the history, was introduced much later with the D-RAID work. And in that work, it was actually called rebuild. Um, it used that term because uh, rebuild is a term commonly used uh, in the RAID community, particularly the declustering RAID community, to talk about the process of recovering your redundancy after you lose a drive and recovering it onto a distributed spare drive. Um, in ZFS and our implementation and, and, and Isaac's implementation of this, it was actually, it's actually driven by a traversal of the space allocation maps rather than the block pool block pointer tree. Um, so currently after, as we were uh, putting out the PR together and getting this integrated back upstream, um, we came up with some new terminology to try to clarify what these two different processes were all about. Uh, and so we defined uh, the reconstruction driven by the block pointer tree as a healing resilver. And uh, I'll talk about reason why here in a second. And then reconstruction driven by space maps, we now call a sequential resilver. Um, and that is largely because it's being driven sequentially through the space maps, uh, where helium silver is being driven by a black point traversal. So, oh, that didn't work. Yep, I just managed to go all the way through my talk. All right, <laughs> helium silver, um, it really gets its name, I believe, from the fact that it's based off of the technology, the re-technology embedded in ZFS for self-healing reads. So we call that, that, that process self-healing reads. Uh, it's that same basic process which we leverage for 
data resilvering uh, that's that's the that goes on the name healing resilver. Uh, it works on all data layouts, on all, at least all data layouts that have some sort of data redundancy, uh, specifically mirrors and RAID Z. Um, as I mentioned, it traverses a block tree to find data reconstruct. What's nice about this process uh, is that it can trim the uh, traversal based off of the block pointer timestamps. So as it's traversing and see I need to just resilver this section of time, it can just visit the blocks, the section of the tree, subsection of the, of the data pointer tree that incorporates just those blocks. The problem with it is that because it's doing it in block pointer order based off of block pointer tree, as a pool ages and your pool, your tree no longer necessarily has its data in chronological order or in, uh, I just say in sequential order on, the, on the, the, uh, the, the media, that traversal of the visiting those block pointers now becomes a, some of a random process. Um, so in particular in situations where you have a lot of small random IO, you know, age tree, you're gonna find that resilver is slower and slower. I'm sure that you've all experienced or at least heard stories of resilverings lasting weeks uh, for pools, particularly pools, uh, raisy pools with large stripe width. So that is um, one of the real problems that we're trying to address with sequential resilver. Um, we, there was an enhancement to the traditional uh, block point tree based traversal healing with silver, which does improve the situation. It batches lots of IOs together by reading a whole bunch of block pointers and then sorting them into a uh, sequential list and then traversing those block pointers. Uh, and at least you're getting, or that, the scale of that, those, that pre-read, uh, a sequential traversal. But since it can only, it's sort of limited by how much memory that it can uh, read ahead into and fill, it can't do the entire drive that way. So it does chunks of the drive. And so you get some sequentialness in your traversal, but it's still not optimal. So what does sequential resilver do? Sequential resilver, as I mentioned, walks the space by, uh, walks the disk via the space maps, the space allocation maps. And it simply looks for the used parts of the drive. So it can break up the allocation into chunks of maximum efficient block sizes so you can sequentially uh, issue appropriate rebuild operations, in case of a mirror copy operation, uh, very efficiently uh, and very quickly traverse through uh, what has actually been allocated on the drive. But in order to do that, it's not using block pointers. So it doesn't have a block pointer to base this IO off of. So instead it cons up a synthetic block pointer for the operation. And of course that synthetic block pointer is not gonna have any checksum information. So there is no checksum data available to be able to verify that the read data is correct before issuing the rights in the reconstruction. That isn't necessarily the end of the world, but it is something to be aware of when you're using sequential resilver. Um, and another important <laughs> critical constraint is because it's, it's basing its uh, traversal off of the uh, space allocation maps and it's synthesizing block pointers, it, this just doesn't work at all for RAID-Z layouts. RAID-Z, uh, as you should know, or well, uh, is a allocation that, that needs the block pointer data to be able to locate the actual data size and parity associated with the RAID-Z layout. And that's just not available when you, all you have to work with is the space allocation maps. So, why use sequential resilver? 
Well, obviously, uh, it's going to be good if your recovery speed is critical. And when is recovery speed not critical? Um, this just reduces your window vulnerability for losing a second drive. You get the data out to uh, replicate it back as quickly as possible. Um, our measurements, particularly on a, a fragmented small block data, shows that sequential silver can be over twice as fast as a healing resilver in being able to recover from uh, a, or replace a drive in a drive out of situation. Um, and in the situation of a two-way mirror, if you think about this, it's actually pretty much always gonna be a reasonable idea, a good idea. In a two-way mirror, you, if you've lost half that mirror, all you have left on the other side of the mirror is one copy of the data, all right? And so copying that to the other half of the mirror, the fact that you were unable to verify that read data before you wrote it to the other side of the mirror is not hurting you in terms of your rebuild, all right? If you, re you had verified the data, you would just simply say, all right, I don't have good data. I, I can't copy the data, so I'm going to have bad data anyway. And for all the good data, you will get a good copy. So it's always a good idea in that situation. Um, but that said, scrubs are sort of critical in sequential resilver. Once you have completed your, your sequential resilver, you really do need to go scrub, go through and say, did I actually lose any data? Did I actually uh, have a problem with any of those copies? Uh, and particularly with metadata is where you may have another copy schooled away in a zero block, uh, then you can correct and uh, detect that situation and, and actually clean up uh, the other half of the mirror. So a scrub, uh, is is not just recommended, but automatically triggered by the sequential resolver code as soon as it completes its work. Now, uh, I believe that you should always scrub <laughs> regularly regardless. Um, and so uh, it's really a moot point, but in this case, scrub is necessary. <clears throat> so why then do you use healing resolver? Well, as I mentioned, healing with silvers are still a useful capability, particularly in time-based outages, where you have uh, not lost a drive, but lost access to a drive for some small period of time. And so you wanna go back and fill in that data. So for DT outages, healing with silver is still gonna be the fastest way to recover the redundancy from that lost data rights. Um, There's also going to be, of course, no need to scrub, no requirement to scrub following reconstruction, since you are already doing the healing reads, you're already detecting any read issues and using any jitter data available or any other copies of the data available as part of your resilver process, a subsequent scrub is, is not required. Um, so that can save you time. Um, if you think about it, the, the a scrub, a healing resilver plus a scrub is going to be slower than a sequential resilver all by its own. Sorry, did I say that right? Yes. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> sequential silver plus a scrub is going to be slower than a healing resilver, just a healing resilver. And so if you're just thinking about it in terms of when can I get back to a state where I know everything is absolutely correct in my drives, the healing resilver is, is actually going to be faster, but the window vulnerability issue makes the sequential resilver still a good idea when you can do it uh, because you, that's really what's important there. Um, finally, um, healing silver is not absolutely necessary if you're talking RAID-Z. We can't scrub uh, RAID-Z or we can't, sorry, resilver RAID-Z with sequential resilver. And so you have to, the only option you have there is a healing resilver at this time. And then the question is, well, what about D-RAID? Um, and I'll answer that in my next talk. But for now, let's um, go ahead and take any questions anybody might have. So first one from Alan Jude. Uh, how does the terminology from the previous semi-sequential resilver, where it uses the range tree to do a block pointer driven resilver, but with uh, fewer random IOPS? So I think that's the one that you mentioned. Uh, yes, so yeah, so the, the semi-sequential is, is the enhancement to uh, the, what we call healing resilver. So healing resilver really covers that now. So that semi-sequential and, 
uh, is, is a variation on the Helium Resilver where we do the batching of the IOs. All right. Uh, second question from uh, Jan Bramkamp. Uh, is sequential resilver limited by the VFS.ZFS.VDEV uh, scrub max active setting? So it is not limited by the scrub max active. Um, it is limited by, go ahead. Second question from Jan. Uh, have you considered comparing the blocks to copy against all remaining copies of the data on multi-way mirrors? So, if you a three-way mirror, then you could, in theory, like you lose one of the disks when you resilver it. There isn't just one copy of the data. So in theory, you could benefit from verifying the checksum when you read from the other way or like reading both sides and be like, oh, if they're the same, then I don't need the checksum or something like that. Right, right, right. So you could sort of get, at least compare the data you get off the other, the, the, if you have multiple copies available, uh, you could potentially compare them, right. But then the question is, I guess, unless you had enough of a quorum to be able to determine that you, what, you know, you had more copies that were this way versus that way. Yeah, you know, that, I don't know that it would help uh, until you had a four-way mirroring. Right. Um, question by Becky Ligon. Uh, how do you specify healing versus sequential resilvering? So in the resilver, uh, when you request a, a resilver, there is a flag. <laughs> and I think it's like minus S for sequential and minus H for healing. But don't quote me, do me in <laughs> TFS and find out. Thank you. And the last question we have here from another one from Jan. Uh, as far as I know, the checksum is only stored in the block pointer. Okay, so it's not a question. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. It's only stored in the block pointer. So you're right. The only way you can get it, to that, that checksum, is if you're going through the block pointer traversal, which is why only a scrub is, one, is the way you're going to find it after a sequential resolver.